When I was a composition student, before I found really professional teachers, I read everything I could find about musical composition. This included books like Schenberg's Fundamentals of Musical Composition, which explained many things in ways I'd never seen before. Although I had studied musical analysis, I often had questions from the point of view of a composer, and sometimes even books like the Schenberg didn't answer them. One thing I noticed in listening to music that I loved was that often the moments I remembered most vividly were climaxes. Although I didn't know at the time why this was the case, I was puzzled that climaxes were never even mentioned in the books I read. Many years later, when I came to write my own composition textbook, Musical Composition, Craft and Art, I made a point of discussing all those things I wished I had found in the existing books when I was younger. Here I want to discuss climax. In my book, it's included in the chapter called Progressing. I'll briefly summarize some of the relevant material below, but I'll also explore some aspects of climax that I didn't mention in my book. But first, the basics. A climax is, by definition, a very intense moment. It corresponds to one or more extremes in the music, like the highest and lowest pitches, the loudest sound, the richest texture, the most dissonant chord, etc. For a major climax, several of these extremes will be combined at the same time. For example, the loudest moment might arrive at the same time as the most dissonant harmony. Climaxes occur on many levels. They can be local, as in one single phrase, or they can be farther reaching, like the climax of a large movement. In a large piece, there will usually be several levels in between. It's important to realize that a climax is never a matter of one single event. Just inserting one loud chord in the middle of a quiet passage won't sound like a climax, just like a mistake. A climax is always the result of a build-up. The build-up creates expectations, and this puts the listener in a state of suspense. The high point is the release. Normally, the intensities of various climaxes are graduated according to their place in the form. A local climax, say of one single phrase, won't equal the force of a climax in a 45-minute symphony. Usually, the largest climaxes tend to occur late in the form for the following reason. Imagine a large piece where the largest climax occurs, let's say, one minute in. What will happen after that? The music will be less intense. But, for example, 15 minutes of music that's less intense and the beginning is a recipe for disappointing the listener. This kind of overall formal progression gives focus to the form, rather like perspective in visual art. It helps us to perceive the form as an organized whole, rather than just a series of more or less equal episodes. There are other aspects to this phenomenon, but the progression of climaxes has a very salient effect within the work as a whole. There are many examples of this in the standard repertoire, and for years I thought this was all there was to say about it. But then I would occasionally encounter pieces where there was no obvious climax. Sometimes the character of the music makes a big climax inappropriate. So how does the composer still manage to maintain interest to the end without disappointing the listener? Let's look at an example, the Andante Cantabile from Mozart's Piano Sonata in C Major, K330. This is a short, rather lyrical movement. That already suggests that a huge dramatic climax would be out of character. But is there really no overall formal progression here? Let's look. This movement is in three sections, first from measure 20, then from measure 21 to 36, and then the first section returns at measure 40, where it's repeated with no changes at all. You may have noticed that I skipped over measures 37 to 40. In these few measures, the beginning of the middle of the section recurs, but it takes a new turn. There's also a little added coda, based on the same material as the middle section, from middle measure 60 to the end. At first glance, this is the ternary form, ABA. But those little additions mitigate the squareness of a simple ternary form. Great composers don't just pour music into existing molds like jello. Simplistic, symmetrical forms are suitable mainly for light, playful music. This movement is not so much playful as lyrical. Okay, now let's look at the first section in more detail, specifically looking for high points. The first section rises gradually from the F in measure 1 to the G in measure 5, then to a little climax in measure 6 on the high C. Nothing very unusual here. In the second half of the first section, measure 9 to 20, the intensity increases due to the modulation to G minor in measure 9 to 10, and then with the fuller scoring in measure 13 to 14, Richard turns, returns again in measure 18. We could say that this whole last phrase acts as the climax of the first section of the piece. It's certainly the most emphatic moment so far. Let's listen. <laughs> 
The middle section is in F minor and it's built out of a variation of the repeated note motive from the first section. Here there's also a little build up as the line rises from B flat in measure 21 to D flat measure 23 and then to E flat measure 25 and F measure 26. Note that all these moments are dissonances. The second half of the middle section eventually rises higher still up to A flat in measure 32 and 33. Then after a rising bass in measure 32 to 34, the texture thickens at the final cadence in measure 34, 35. So here too the last phrase has a feeling of culmination. Let's listen. So, within each section there's a mild progression of peaks, but what about the movement overall? We still haven't discussed that little transition in measure 37 to 40. At this point we would normally expect the first section to return. By adding a formal detour, Mozart creates a sense of instability for a while, so that when the first section does return it feels like a release of tension. Note also the more intense harmony in measure 39, creating added suspense before the cadence and the subsequent return. Bringing back the first section with no changes at all can hardly be called a build-up to a larger climax. Does this contradic contradict my notion of climax? I think the reason Mozart added the little coda was precisely to make the overall shape more convincing and the ending more final. Although it's not a huge dramatic moment, it does provide something new and is, in a subtle way, a satisfying culmination. This is because it combines two things. First, by going back to the form of the theme we heard in the middle section, but now in major, we're given a little jolt of surprise. Instead of just finishing as expected in measure 60, the music unexpectedly goes on. Second, notice that the bass line goes lower than anywhere else in the movement, reaching down to the low B in measure 62. This helps to give us the feeling that we've gone as far as we can go, to an extreme, within the limits of the musical character of this movement. Roger Sessions spoke of what he called the accumulation principle. By this he meant that as a piece of music advances, there needs to be an overall increase in intensity. Of course, this doesn't mean that every piece is just a long crescendo. There'll be hills and valleys along the way, the music has to breathe. The Mozart example shows us that accumulation is not necessarily in the direction of loudness, but rather towards an increasingly rich web of associations and expectations which the composer can then manipulate to make an emotional voyage more intriguing and more intense. This movement is an excellent example of the accumulation principle, finally leading to an extreme moment, that low B in the coda, but in a less obvious way than the large dramatic gestures I referred to at the start of today's lesson. But the overall accumulation of the form is nonetheless quite clear. <laughs>